Hello and welcome to this Code Rage session. My name is Stephen Ball and I'm going to be taking you through cross-platform secure database storage for mobile and desktop. So before we get going, a little bit about me. I'm one of the RAD sales consultants and also the associate product manager for Interbase at Embarcadero. And if you'd like to catch up with me, then you can do on stephen.ball at embarcadero.com. Or you can follow me on Twitter at Delphia Ball and also up on the blogs at blogs.embarcadero.com. So as we go through today, the, the synopsis really um, from this session is uh, around data storage being a critical part of any application. Uh, and especially as more and more business applications adopt mobile platforms. And this is something that I know a lot of us need to think about. And within the market today, um, CIOs are embracing bring your own device as a way to mobilize their workforce. But there's a number of risk factors that this brings. And um, till now, a lot of people have kind of shied away from putting data onto the mobile devices or storing it there for, for any period of time due to the increased risk factors. And, and we're going to be exploring that as we go through today and, uh, and the importance of needing to be able to get data uh, in a manageable way uh, onto devices. So a, a key part of this really is about how we can give you the edge uh, and make you aware of what you can do um, with your mobile applications and considerations you need to take into effect when designing up and looking after um, data storage uh, on the desktop and on mobile. So a few questions um, to be answered as we go through and a few things to look at. Um, why use local storage in an application in the first point? Is this something that we actually need to do? How bring your own device really mixes in uh, to the mobile world we live in today and what challenges that brings. Also, where do we need to worry about data? Um, it's probably actually a little bit further afield than you think, so we're going to explore that as we come through today. There's a very brief introdu introduction to a couple of key roles that you need to identify within organisations to help um, help them and to, to help you if you're selling your software into them um, to become aware and that's the data processor and the data controller so we'll quickly introduce those roles as we go through and then we'll talk about what protection looks like and what it needs to be from both a, a requirements uh, and a conformance stance um, what do we actually need to be looking for and finally we'll be looking at how you can protect your data very simply, everywhere, and uh, we'll be we're showing you how to actually do that in practice. So first of all, let's start with why use local storage in our applications? Well, it's the same reasons really that we've been using local storage on network um, devices for a long time. Um, it reduces network connectivity, uh, it improves concurrency to your central server. Uh, it reduces mobile data costs, which is a massive part um, of the cost structure within the mobile architecture that we need to worry about as um, software developers. Because if we're going back and fetching the same data over and over and over again, then that really is going to ramp up the running costs of our software compared to others. So local storage is a very effective way of maintaining cost and reducing cost uh, as an, on an ongoing basis. Also, if you want to do offline data work, uh, and this is really where in the enterprise traditionally it's been used a lot more. Um, if you're working on laptops, taking things out into the field, doing data collection, data analysis, data processing. The same things apply for mobile though. Um, if you're on the train or if you're in the middle of the countryside where there's no data um, signal or if you're in the middle of um, some huge concrete buildings, it's very often difficult to get uh, a mobile reception or certainly one that you can work successfully off. 
So, you know, there's a number of good reasons why you want to be able to use offline data for working. And, and a big benefit is around increased speed and performance, uh, obviously the scalability, but also the um, where you've got that data offline, you're actually able to increase your um, performance, not only in terms of the application speed, but as an organization in your operations performance and speed um, to, to be able to deal with customer requests and, uh, and get them promptly processed. So some of the, um, the challenges that come with local storage, obviously a big bit is about controlling where data is stored. And uh, often you need to be flexible within your applications about where you want it stored. That can lead to either fixed or remote disks being used. Uh, if it's a removable disk, then this um, opens up the door for that data being inadvertently or um, avertedly taken and carried out uh, outside the organization. Um, now that exposes uh, risk that you need to be able to control, especially if you've got data that can identify people, customers, patients, uh, or whatever, you know, any data that can identify people is something that needs to be managed um, from a conformance point, from a legal point. So where it's stored on disk can be quite a challenge. But also we have the security over the wire as well. Um, so if you're communicating from a remote machine to a server, then you've got the network traffic to monitor and, and worry about. So you really should be using HTTPS um, or OpenSSL to be able to communicate with your servers to process data back and forth. Now, in terms of where bringing your own device is really making a big change in the shift away from uh, traditional desktop and laptop architectures for, for networks, is um, you know, we just look at this chart here, and I'm sure this is one that if you've been on some Embarcadero presentations in the last year, you may well have seen before. But uh, the latest stats that I've seen up on the register um, talk about how um, the big blue area in the middle there, Windows, uh, the Wintel area is down to about 30% of market share. 30%. So when it comes to the devices that are going to be connecting up, that customers are going to be wanting to use to communicate with your systems for processing data, you know, laptops will win out in the enterprise environment for the sheer volume of what you can do with them. But don't be fooled into thinking that mobile and tablets don't have a place, uh, even on products that you've had out there for you know, 10, 15 years. Um, mobile, we're seeing, is really taking a big chunk in because there's often things that you want to be able to do, you know, some small tasks that need to be constantly done, uh, that may be done on the road, um, where you need to just be able to turn up with your iPad, select a few things, process an order, send it back. We're seeing uh, a growth, a big growth in business to consumer and business to business applications around the mobile platforms. And one of the big constraints there obviously is data. And this is gonna you know, completely continue. Um, smartphones are going to be moving up to about 78% of the global handset shipped uh, by 2016, according to Gartner. And if you look at the mix, then iOS and Android uh, are maintaining their dominance through that sector. Um, they're predicting uh, Windows Mobile uh, will actually will grow into the mix uh, in the future as well. Um, but very much Android and iOS being a very, very big part of that. And if you look at the tablet usage as well, um, iOS is expected to maintain about half the market around the, the tablet usage, with the other half really being um, Android and a small sector for, for Windows Mobile and others. So bring your own device. It really is being embraced at the moment by 
uh, by CIOs. As you can see, there's such a, a growth in, in mobile and smartphones within the mobile area that by being able to give employees the chance to use their own devices, um, it increases their efficiency, uh, increases the flexibility they have around working. Uh, if they can process some of the common things regularly from wherever they are from their mobile, then it means the business gets a lot more uh, efficiency uh, and the employee's satisfaction actually is, is raised because they can actually deal with things um, as they need to or when they're on the train or when they're away from their desk. So when they get back to their desk, they haven't got this heavy workload that suddenly appeared from them. It gives them a, a feeling of a lot more control on their work. And bring your own device, really, you know, because everybody's getting them, uh, why spend out the cost as a CIO? Why spend you know four or five hundred um, dollars a head to, to provide these devices out when the you know when your staff are bringing them in themselves anyway? And who would want to carry two devices around? So it really is kind of just it's it has a lot of sense. And one thing that we're seeing is that, you know, different devices are being used at different times of the day as well. Um, mobiles tend to be used in the morning. Uh, I certainly use mine. The first thing I do in the morning is turn my alarm off on my phone. And then I kind of check the wife's asleep. And if she is, I can have a quick look at my emails. If not, I have to take my phone downstairs and make a cup of tea and then look at my emails. Um, but you, you get the chance... Um, because it's instant on, you can do those common things very, very quickly. And uh, it gives me a chance to reply to a few of my colleagues out in Australia if I need to at any point. And then through the day, I'll typically be working on my laptop. Um, I quite often have my phone in my pocket. And if I'm walking around the office, I might check some emails between desks on my phone or something. But certainly in the evening, um, I find that's kind of peak time really for tablet use. Quite often be sat browsing the net on the on the tablet rather than on a, a laptop it's just so much easier and, uh, and, be, and be working on my tablet to do things so bring your own device really is coming in uh, we've already had a look at some of the local storage challenges and um, you know bring your own device really adds to the challenges around local storage because all of a sudden there's a blurring of personal and business data there's a device security um, consideration to be introduced um, where, where these devices are not owned by the company. Then you need to worry about the capabilities that are on those devices. There's certainly not a policy that you can implement particularly easily around mobile phone usage that your staff have if you're not uh, in some way controlling what they can use with the mobiles. So this really means that your applications need to have that security capabilities built into them because it's just too hard to actually have that policy against the hardware level. Mobile phones are probably the most stolen thing at the moment. Um, when you look at uh, what's stolen from pe uh, people personally, uh, certainly uh, I've seen reports where it's much higher than wallet theft. Um, because they're worth so much more. And also you are much more likely to lose them. Um, and also what happens if they fail? Uh, if, you've got, um, if you've got stuff on the devices. So they do raise a whole load of um, support challenges. And one of the things that we've been seeing recently in the press as well is how much Android is being targeted at the moment by malware uh, and in fact there was a, an article out this uh, this last week start of October um, 2013 talking about how security analytics firms are refusing to actually mention a specific plugin that's being actively used by a lot of um, developers at the moment for displaying ads on Android and they reckon there's over 200 million devices worldwide that have these um, this adware installed, and they've 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 discovered 
some serious vulnerabilities that having that adware in your application brings for the ability to run remote scripts. And you know, this is a, a big issue that um, is now being identified uh, on Android and they're having to try and get fixed and sorted. So, uh, you know, there is a, a big challenge uh, and often things that you can't control around around external devices being used. Now, bring your own device really wrestles you with three key operational factors. I say governance and compliance. Um, bring your own device could cause you to violate rules, regulations, trust, intelligence, um, property and other critical business obligations. Mobile device management. You need to be able to manage growing workforce expectations around mobility. And your employees use many devices. They expect to use any device or application anytime and anywhere. And security. What do you do if it's left unmanaged? Um, bring your own device can lead to loss of control. Impact your network availability and cause data loss. And you need to, you need the right access um, strategies and policies in place to secure your environment around security. Now, this is stuff, and um, these three key factors is something actually directly from the Gartner website um, from 2013. The link is at the bottom of the screen here. Um, so it's not just us saying this. This is stuff from Gartner, from uh, from a number of series of organisations out there that you need to be looking at security specifically around your data with Bring Your Own Device. And it's not just the typical areas that we need to worry about data. Um, obviously, we've been worrying about it for years with laptops, and um, but there's also kind of a range of additional kind of devices uh, with the tablets, the phones, external drives, USB flash drives, um, even data that's in you know, briefcases, you need to be worrying about data that's managed by your company absolutely everywhere. And you know, more and more we're seeing data on embedded devices as well. So when it comes to talking to organizations about your product, uh, about data, about things they need to consider when they're going through the, the sales process, or even if you're consulting with them um, about things they need to, to con they need to consider. There's really two roles that you need to identify. The first is the data controller. Now the data controller is either somebody who works by themselves or with other people to determine the purpose for which and the manner in which any personal data is stored uh, and or processed. Now, when it comes to a data processor, now this is the typical role that you find. These are people who work with personal data by any means um, and isn't somebody who's the uh, an employee of the data controller. So these are people who are putting data in, pulling data out, analyzing data, whatever they're doing with the data, they're a data processor. The data controller is somebody who defines and manages the security roles, um, where data can be used, um, who can and can't touch the data. That's a data controller compared to somebody who uses it, which is the data processor. And it's important to identify these because um, these are key people, uh, especially the data controller, in, in the purchasing of software. Uh, and quite often you'll find uh, it's somebody from the HR department or from finance, or they may even have a, a chief data security officer. Um, but these are all people that you need to identify. So once you've identified the right people to talk to about data within the organization, um, data protection is the key thing that you need to talk about. So protection in simple means encryption. Uh, and typically it means 256 encryption. Uh, there's standards within the US and the UK, um, uh, FIPS compliance, 
um, which which specifically target 256 compli um, data compliance. Um, it goes beyond just the basic encryption low. Um, it really is a whole um, mantra to look at around data security. But data encryption, wherever you look worldwide, is being really pushed at 256-bit encryption uh, at, uh, as the basic point. And there's a big misconception, um, and this is a nice one from Simon Rice, who works for the Information Commissioner's Office within the, uh, within the UK. Uh, let's get this one out of the way first. A common misconception is that just requiring users to log into a device or service with a username and password provides an equivalent level of protection to encryption. This isn't the case. A password or a PIN to control access to a device isn't encryption, and it isn't enough to protect against unauthorised or unlawful access. In practice, a password can be easily circumvented and full access to the data can be achieved. So this is pretty key. This tells us that um, the enforcement agencies worldwide don't see just a pin or a swipe on a device enough of a security measure to protect data. And um, we'll have a look at a bit more of that and why that's important to understand as we go through in a moment. But basically, you've got two types of encryption. Apart from none encryption, that is. It's either full disk encryption, so you can get the disks encrypted completely, and there's a software options to do this. And this is perfectly fine whilst the data is on the disk. However, when the data has been removed from the disk, it's no longer secure. So if you have the ability to copy a file onto a flash USB drive, that's a security hole. Individual files is a much better way to encrypt your data. If the file is encrypted, it doesn't matter where it exists, if it's on a disk that's encrypted or if it's on a non-encrypted disk, if it's on a USB drive, if it's on a phone, wherever that file is, if the data is physically encrypted in the file, then it's encrypted. Now, this is quite interesting for compliance. You really need to encrypt now. Uh, and I've highlighted just a little bit from, from this website from the ICO. In future, where such losses occur and where encrypted software had, encryption software has not been used to protect data, regulatory action, regulatory action may be pursued. So there's been a number of um, recent uh, incidents around laptops and personal information where it's been stolen, um, where it's been inappropriately placed and so on. And they're really really kind of pointing out here that regulatory action will be pursued where the data is not encrypted. And I've got a couple of quick case studies I want to share with you here. The first one's Jala Transport Limited. Now this was a very small company, a one-person company. They had a hard drive in a bag. Now the hard drive had an 11-digit password on it. The data however was not encrypted. He stopped at some traffic lights. Somebody stole the bag from his car window. He received a fine of £5,000 for the breach of data. Here's another one of a slightly larger organisation, the National Health Service in the UK. Now they had approximately 1,570 hard drives containing sensitive personal data. Didn't know how many patients were stored on the disks, it's very hard to tell. Now, they had no previous breach of data. The drives were, they had to, they recovered some of the drives and the only way to get the data off them was using file recovery programs. So they, they had a good attempt at wiping the data. The data controller, however, received written assurances from the company that they provided the, the drives to for disposal that they would be physically destroyed. The data was not encrypted. Now there's some issue around the contract they had with the, um, the, uh, the people they passed the hard drives to. A number of the drives ended up getting sold 
rather than being physically destroyed. However, even though they had that assurance, there was a £200,000 fine. Now, here's another one. Alaska State, a $1.7 million fine. Now, here, again, the key thing is a loss of an unencrypted USB drive that may have contained protected patient information. And because they didn't have safeguards in place, they ended up with a $1.7 million federal fine. Here's another one, Blue Cross Blue Shield. $1.5 million fine. Again, the key thing here, unencrypted information that was stolen. So they actually had 57 hard drives stolen from a data storage cabinet within their organization. But because the data on the drives wasn't encrypted, even though it was securely, it was you know, reasonably well stored in a cabinet on their, on their premises, they got broken into, it was stolen, they ended up with a $1.5 million fine. And they also had to agree a 450 day corrective action plan that inc included encrypting all at rest data. Now that's pretty serious. You know, who would have thought that having data on your premises in a cabinet locked up overnight, that somebody would break in, steal it, that you'd end up with a massive $1.5 million fine. But it happens. But it's not just the cost of having the fines that really kind of hits an organization. Typically, once an organization has had a data protection breach, there is a churn of around three to 4% of their customer base. So if you've got 100,000 customers, that's three to 4,000 customers you will lose because of that security breach. There's the costs obviously around the regulatory and uh, uh, fulfillment side, but also around dealing with customers. You, know, you typically end up with have customer hotlines set up or um, abilities for customers to be able to call in. That takes time and effort. You may need to contact all the customers. You may end up finding that you have to offer discounts for future products and services to compensate the customers for the fact that their data may have been lost. And also there's a whole load of in-house communications and training that you need to do to help manage this breach. So it really does have quite an impact against the company to have data lost, stolen, through any means. So when it comes to local database storage for mobile, there's really two options that you have got today. There's SQL Lite, which is kind of a free database. It doesn't have any inbuilt security with it. It's single read, single write. It's a bit like, or I kind of term it a flat file on steroids. It, um, because the data is stored into a flat file format um, and the data can be pulled out in a, in a number of different ways and the implementation is different from device to device um, depending on the version of SQLite that exists and how the vendors have opted to integrate it in, into their platforms. Or the other option is Interbase. Now in, Embarcadero own the Interbase database and we've done a lot of work to enable it to work on mobile platforms. Uh, and this is no small feat, especially when you consider that to have a database on a mobile device, um, for example, iOS does not allow you to have any external libraries. So you can't have any drivers that are outside your program. Everything's got to be completely compiled into your application. Interbase with Delphi and C++ Builder um, will allow you to compile straight into your application and run it out onto those platforms today. We have two versions. So we have IB Lite, 
which is um, a, a lightly featured version. It doesn't have the security in it. However, it does provide you as software developers a foundation point that you can work on. And then we have interbase to go which is exactly the same as IB Lite, apart from the license files slightly different. And that enables different functionality within the database. Uh, allows you to have more than 100 megs disk storage. Uh, it includes um, fully featured um, security features around 256 um, security uh, with encryption. So it really is kind of if you want to offer the, the light edition of your products and then the professional edition, which includes all the security, um, you can do this with just a, well, with zero lines of code, really, um, with interbase to go So interbase really is the answer. Um, it has the same on disk structure for Windows, for Mac, for iOS, for Android, for Linux, and for Solaris. It means it's very easy and secure for data to be worked on on each of those devices, on each of those platforms. So as a developer, you can build and work with a database. You can play with encrypted data. You can then pass that directly onto an iOS or an Android device, or deploy it out onto a, a laptop somewhere, knowing that data is secure. It gives your data administrators the chance to create databases that they want to use uh, as remote caches on different platforms as well. And they'll be able to check it out on their desktop machine and pass it to mobile devices very, very easily done. There's on-disk encryption built in to the to-go edition, the desktop edition and the server edition. And this provides you the chance to use full 256 or a weaker 56-bit encryption. We have over-the-wire encryption if you're communicating to a remote server that uses OpenSSL. Interbase has a two-phase commit, so even if you pull the power out or the battery dies on a device at the point you're working with the database, it will restore itself automatically to a solid foundation point that's uncorrupted uh, uh, and you'll be ready to off and go. So it really is a true zero admin database. And it also has some self optimization um, caching in there as well to ensure that it works very, very quickly. It has a tiny footprint. Um, we're talking a few meg for the whole core database engine. And it's fully embeddable for iOS and Android, and even on Windows and Mac as well. Interbase is very, very fast. It has um, uh, some, some core features built in that give it a very quick performance. And it's supporting all our major development platforms here. So you can find out more about Interbase at www.embarcadero.com forward slash products, forward slash interface. Okay, so now it's time for us to get into some demos. Um, joining me for the demos, I've got Gabe Goldfield from the, from the Interbase team. Hi, Gabe. Hi, Stephen. So first of all, let's, um, let's have a quick look at uh, an example of Interbase running with some encryption uh, and how we're able to leverage this out into to mobile. So, Quite simply here, we've got a, a mobile project that we can target out to both Android and iOS. And we can see here we've got some data showing for the HR employee. And um, this has the salary visible. But if we actually have a look here for the um, standard employee, then the data is not visible. And uh, this is actually, we'll have a look, this is running the same queries, um, just with a slight difference in the connection string to do with the different username. Um, but other than that, everything that's controlling this data uh, and the visibility is managed at the column level within the uh, employee table uh, of this database. So just to show you here, we've got our, our two data connections. The HR employee has uh, the, the full name salary from the employee coming back. And the, uh, the standard employee is exactly the same query. Uh, 
um, but we get the zeros back. So this is actually data controlled in the data level. And if we actually have a, a look at the parameters here on each of the, the database settings, here we can see we're using the, the HR employee. Uh, and on the other one, it's exactly the same. Uh, I'll actually put up the editor here, but we're, we're using the new employee as the, the data connection. So this is great. This actually really helps control the data. And not only we're able to use the users to prevent specific people seeing that data, but that data is actually encrypted on disk. And um, even if the, the database was stolen and somebody hacked into your phone, or um, if you had a, a customer who, or a, a client who'd uh, rooted their phone and hadn't told you about it, and there's big security holes there that people have to just copy files off, um, the data is actually encrypted and secured in the database, which is pretty cool. So let's have a quick look at the script that um, made this possible and what you need to run against your database to actually uh, create the user level encryption um, and talk a bit about um, how the different users exist, what the different types of roles they have, and uh, just kind of gives you a broad understanding really about what the uh, the data encryption stuff can do um, and, uh, and how it works. So, Gabe, do you want to take us through the script? Sure, I'd love to. Um, this is a very simple script that we use to alter the employee database to uh, give different levels of encryption and decryption to different users. So, in order to use encryption, the first thing you have to do is alter the database and add the admin option. You also need a SysDSO user. The SysDSO user will manage your encryptions. It's not necessarily the SysDBA's job. The SysDBA might not be someone that you want to see the data. It might just be your database administrator. So we created a, an encryption administrator, SysDSO. In this example, so this would be kind of ideal for somebody who's like a data controller in the organization who sets the uh, the rules around what you do with data. If this would be their, their login. They wouldn't be able to kind of modify the data, but they can actually set the security rights around exactly. the data. Exactly. They can say new employees okay, that's pretty cool. can't see this. HR, we want you to see what you need to see, and vice versa. And different companies can have a variety of different roles. Um, in this example, we also wanted to show that in the same table, you can have different levels of encryption. Uh, in this example, we have the sales user is has a 256 AES, which is strong encryption. The uh, HR user has DES 56, which is our lowest. We call it weak encryption. So um, the flow of it, excuse me, the flow of it is to add the admin options, create your users, then you're going to create your encryptions, assign them to different roles, and then you're going to start uh, picking, in the example that Stephen just showed, we pick the salary. Uh, the HR employee can see the salary, the new employee can't. You could pick any field and assign it to a different role. It's probably better to assign it to a role than to specific users. That can be hard to manage. So, so that means that um, if you've got a number of people in the HR department, you can all give them the same HR role. Yes. That makes it very easy. And also, if you wanted to have, say, um, uh, somebody in the HR department also played a role in finance. You could give that to you could give them that role as well as a user. Yes, it's it's much like managing domains. Somebody might be involved in a few domains, but not uh, specifically just one. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes you know, user security very flexible, really, doesn't it? So that's cool. There's one other line that I want to talk about. Um, in the middle, we are creating a backup key. So the, the backup key is for backing up and restoring your database. And it needs to be, when you create this backup key, uh, if you use our tools, it will happen for you, like IB Console Wizard. But if you use it in a script like this, it needs to match the strongest encryption in that table or in that database. So in this example, we're using strong encryptions, 256 bits. If we were to choose a backup key weaker than the strongest encryption, then when it was time to uh, back up and restore, you wouldn't get all the data properly. OK, so it's basically a quill that you have what you can get. So you need to just make sure you're using the strongest one. Exactly. OK, that's pretty cool. 
and, and obviously this is a, an example where we're looking at um, controlling encryption at the column level on the database because encryption has a slight overhead to it but um, uh, encrypting only the specific bits that we need to can, can be quite a beneficial kind of from a performance point but equally if we just want to be hey it's not a massive database there's not a lot of data in there we want to just throw it all in quite happily or we've got super servers and we're quite happy for it to encrypt and decrypt everything because it goes all the time um, you, you can roll just full database encryption without having to worry about setting individual columns, yes. can't you? Yes, you can. You can encrypt every database or just what you consider the security risks. And then, or as in this example, you can just say, I just want one column in this database that nobody can see. Cool. Okay, so um, after we've set our, our backup password, um, what's the next thing that we do here? Okay, in this example, uh, SysDBA is the database owner. It doesn't have to be, but the next thing you would do after you've created your encryption keys is allow the owner to set who can use these encryptions and what they're associated with. So we've been, we're granting the encryption option on to SysDBA for the backup key, the HR key, and the sales key. And in the next... Okay, so because we're connected as the, the, the data controller in essence, we need to allow the, the database administrator to allow access to other users mm -hmm. with that encryption. Exactly. Okay, cool. So now that we've granted the encryption option on to SysDBA, SysDBA can now alter the database and allow different users, different levels of encrypt and decrypt. So we're letting the HR key see the salary, and then we're setting the salary to zero for as a default. So in the previous example, you saw new employees saw zero. It wasn't a no value, it was something that we chose. We could choose it to a million. We could... Hey, I wouldn't mind that salary. <laughs> exactly. <myself. no. laughs> okay, so that's pretty cool. So not only can we control what you see when you haven't got the rights, we're not stopping any scripts running um, when, from a developer point, we can just say, just put the same script in here. Even if you haven't got rights to, to run uh, and view that data, will give you the, the, the dummy empty value back that we define as a, as a company. So if it's a string field, you could put no access or something. Clear. Exactly. Restricted yeah. is something that we commonly used. For... Okay, cool. Okay, so that's pretty cool. We've, we're able to use here, we've got two different encryption keys on the same table, working on different columns, allowing different data to be seen by different users. So the in this example, the HR department um, can see the salary, and the sales people can see the phone extensions. Uh, of the, uh, okay. Probably not the most real world example, but it's kind of useful to be able to see anyway. Um, but once we've um, once we've kind of got these encryptions in place and ready to, to roll, um, what's this uh, additional kind of line here for the local employee? Um, for well, the in this example, uh, the default employee database, which we use for many samples and examples, starts with grant all. And that's been going on for years and before the concept of encryptions. So in this example, we revoke all from public and then we re-grant, select, insert, update, delete, but not encrypt or decrypt. And now the public, the normal user, is just like in the example, new employee, they can see what we want them to see. while um, since we, it still respects the encrypt and decrypt for the HR employee and sales user. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So it is possible to create um, uh, a super user who's got the on tool on de uh, encryption, decryption stuff, um, if you wanted to. Uh, and then with other users, you can control specifically what they can see. Mm -hmm. You could do that with a key also. Mm -hmm. Grant every field to that key and then assign it to you. Uh, user or role. Okay, super. Thanks very much, Gabe. That's been really helpful um, to, to get an understanding about the sheer power uh, of what we can do with the, the encryption side of things. Um, and obviously, this is the most granular level down at the column level, um, but we could set up at a much higher level in just a couple of lines, you know, encrypting the whole database, um, which is typically what you probably want to do if you're deploying directly out onto to remote devices. Um, 
but this certainly gives you the, the flexibility to to use the the right amount of encryption uh, with the data that you need to. If you've got a whole load of data that's not needed to be encrypted, then why waste processor cycles on doing encryption decryption, right? So. Okay, so I just want to finish off now with some uh, useful links that I found through uh, looking through getting this stuff pulled together. So the first slide I'd like to share with you is just a, uh, the ISO um, standards for information technology uh, data management. Um, so the systems management one's 27001, um, 2005 is the current draft, uh, which is going through some updates at the moment into the 2013 draft. But this looks at security techniques, uh, information security management and requirements. And uh, this certainly is uh, a specification that's worth um, being aware of if you're selling into especially larger organisations or if you work in a larger organisation. Um, this really identifies the roles of the, um, the data processors and the, um, and the data controllers uh, and, and looks into what they kind of do and how they bring the value back to the company. Also, a um, couple of key links, really. The documentation on Interbase is excellent. Uh, if you go to docs.embarcadero.com, then you'll be able to find the link in there for the products for Interbase. And there's a whole uh, API user guide, um, developer guide, reference guide, language guide, and so on. There's, there's a whole set of language uh, and usage ref um, reference materials there. And also there's a nice example showing you how to build your first application up on DocWiki. Uh, if you run through docwiki.embarcadero.com, uh, you'll be able to find the Interbase database encryption in Rad Studio example. So really to summarize today's session, the world is going mobile. And wherever we have data going mobile, uh, or even you know, with our desktops and even in the offices. But anywhere data is, you need to worry about it. Security equals encryption. You need to get on-disk encryption built into your applications so it doesn't matter where the data is, it's secure. And Interbring, Interbase brings you all of this on Windows, on Mac, on iOS, on Android, on Linux, and Solaris. So with Interbase on mobile, we've got IB Lite to get you started and then to move up to the to go edition to bring in all the security levels. So there's no reason why you shouldn't be using Interbase in any mobile application uh, and then having the upgrade path and option available to you. So in short, go encrypt your data now. But first, some time for some Q&A.